All right, guys. So um, today we're going to talk about the road to conflict. This is part one. Uh, I'm going to try and get through this video as quickly as possible um, because you guys got better things to do as well. Um, so there are videos within this slideshow, but I'm not going to play them for you because you can watch them on your own time. Um, these slides are also in Canvas. So here's where we start. American history. This is exciting. Okay. Uh, as I said, I'm going to skip through this video. Uh, so don't worry about that. You're not missing much if you skip through it while you're filling out your notes. Um, first of all, we're going to start with a war. Start things off with a bang. Uh, we've got the French and Indian War. And this is kind of a confusing title because it's not the French versus the Indians. It is actually the French and the Indians versus the British. And included in the British are the British colonies, which is this country eventually. Um, so you can kind of see on this map over here, let me try and find my little, uh, is it going to, oh yeah, there we go, the circle. Okay, so you can see on this right side here of the map, the East Coast, um, that is all Great British Territory. And so even though the people here are going to be eventually called Americans, right now, they're British. Um, all this French territory out here, um, we're going to kind of see what happens with that. So just kind of watch that space for now. Um, but you also notice like out west here, even parts of Western North Carolina and Tennessee, um, those, those borders and those lines aren't really well drawn. And there's not a ton of people living out there that we know. So that's why it's grayed out here. Um, the French and Indian War is a European conflict that is being fought in North America. So Britain and France hate each other's guts. And they're trying to fight this war, not just in Europe, but also in the land in North America. So that's what's going on here. Um, as I mentioned, it's a 500 year old rivalry. The British and the French actually fought a war called the Hundred Years War, which lasted 116 years. Um, that's how much they hate each other. And um, they just kept that war going for over 100 years. Um, there is conflict mostly because the British colonists are starting to push west. And that is, as you saw on the map here, French territory. And so the French are kind of like, whoa, 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 guys, that red area, that is your area. You stay over there. And the American slash British colonists are kind of like, yeah, but we want this land. Um, there's also a pretty big difference between how the French and the British use land. Um, the British were definitely trying to cultivate it into agriculture for profits. Whereas a lot of that French territory on the map, they're not really developing that land. They're working with Native Americans to make money off of fur trading. Um, so that's kind of a big deal and a big difference between the two countries. Um, the course of the war, this is kind of a short war. Um, it's called the Seven Years War in Europe. We call it the French and Indian War because uh, that's what it's called in North America. Um, but it, it is fought, as I said earlier, in Europe and North America. Um, this is where a young George Washington kind of gets his first experience in combat. Um, and he is hugely influential in this. He is not terribly successful, but when we get to another conflict a little bit later on, um, he is going to be one of the most experienced generals in the room. And so this experience, while not terribly successful for Washington, is invaluable to him and to the colonies and the Revolutionary War. Um, there is another politician here worth knowing. His name's William Pitt. And if that last name sounds somewhat familiar, the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is going to be named after him. So he's a British politician that eventually gets Congress, not Congress, but Parliament to send more supplies to the British troops. And in that, that it helps the British defeat the French and the Indians in here uh, in North America. Um, the war ends by really the Native Americans that aren't super cool with the French, the Iroquois joining on the side of the British. Um, the Iroquois were looking at this conflict and saying, like, who are we going to benefit from winning here? Are we going to benefit from the French and other Native American tribes, some of which the Iroquois had been warring with? Or are we going to benefit from the British? And I hate to say it, but it's hard to know if they would have benefited from the French winning. Um, that's a huge hypothetical here. We don't know what would have happened if the French had won in North America. Um, the city of Quebec, which is a French speaking city even to this day, um, is captured. That's a huge loss for the French in Canada, um, which is French territory at this time. That eventually Canada would become British territory. We're gonna talk about that again when we get to the War of 1812. America really wanted Canada in 1812. 
Um, we didn't get it. Um, and the two countries are still separate today. Um, so again, for the war being called the Seven Years War, fighting lasts nine years. I've already mentioned to you that the Hundred Years War lasted 116 years. Some things in history are poorly named. That's all I can say. Um, and then by 1763, the French are defeated and the British are saying, go back to France, get out of North America. And so this map that, that we have basically on uh, slide three here, where you see all this blue territory, that's going to be gone. Okay, I'm going to skip back here. We've got our before and our after. Before, lots of French territory. Okay, on this map, it is yellowy orange, whatever color you see there. And then the after is there's no French territory. Now, again, the simplicity is, technically speaking, all of that territory is British, but the reality is there's still French people living there. There's still Native Americans living there. So, um, yeah. And the reason I mention that is because the British are going to say to the colonists, hey, look, guys, this whole war started because you guys were moving west. We need you to stop moving west. How do, how do they enforce that? Well, they're going to draw a line on a map, basically, and say, if you cross this line, you're on your own. And so they really want people to not cross the line. But like five-year-olds who, you know, are told not to touch a hot stove, colonists cross the line. Um, and a lot of colonists are saying, look, if we don't cross, if we cross this line, the British are saying we're on our own, cool. But we also don't have to pay taxes. So the incentive to not pay taxes is going to attract a lot of people west into that territory. Um, it is worth pointing out that I said this already, but the French and the Native Americans in that territory over the line are still there. Um, they didn't, you know, pack up everything and leave just because they lost. And so there are a lot of Native Americans and a lot of French who will shoot uh, British colonists on the spot if they're in that territory, even though on a map it belongs to Britain. Um, so again, this is a little bit of a conflicting, uh, complicated story. But um, I point that out too because that line is going to basically... Uh, be a point of conflict for the colonists and the British government later on. We're getting there. Um, two key reasons for the conflict, the proclamation line I just mentioned, and a war is a very expensive thing. And so the British had a, having to win the war means that they have debts. And how do you pay those debts? Well, you increase taxes. Um, the colonists in America have to pay taxes for the war that really protected them from dying or protected them from becoming French speaking. Uh, but the colonists don't see it this way. They're like, well, look, we didn't really want this war. You guys fought this war. You're asking us to pay. That doesn't seem fair. And the British government says, look, we did you a service. Okay. A waiter or a waitress delivers your food. And at the end of the meal, you pay for that service. Right. And so the British government is not really listening to the colonists uh, complaints here. They say, look, we saved your butts. All you can do is complain. That's not really fair. Um, as I mentioned with the proclamation line, uh, this is going to break down a little bit more here, but it's a ban on colonists settling west of the Appalachian Mountains, um, which again has the unintended knock on effect of people moving west to not pay taxes. And some people are down for a little bit of risk, right? They want to go over there, buy as much land or take up as much land as possible. And if a Native American tribe finds them and kills them, you know, oh, well, we tried. Um, but the British do not want that because they don't want another war. They don't want to have to bail out the colonists again in the future because it's an expensive thing. Um, one of the big reasons it's expensive is because Britain is 3,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean, and to get troops or weapons or supplies to North America, they have to put it on a boat and ship it over. So, you know, this isn't just like a, oh, well, let's see how many pennies we can find on the couch kind of thing. This is like a, if there's another war, it is going to be a very expensive thing. I mentioned that again because, a little bit of foreshadowing here, but when the colonists start to protest the British... And then there's a war that leads to the revolution or a revolution that leads to a war, I should say. Um, the British government is going to have a lot of problems trying to win that war. Um, it's a very expensive thing to send troops to North America to defeat the colonists. So um, the, the line, again, has this kind of knock on effect, this third bullet point here, where the colonists believe that the line shows the British don't care about them. So 
where the British are saying, no, no, this line is to protect you. The colonists are like, okay, but if I cross it, you're not going to save me. And the British government is like, yes, that is correct. Um, the British expenses lead to more in taxes. That's what I mentioned earlier, but um, this also leads to a crackdown on smuggling. Um, smuggling is basically just selling something illegally. And so a lot of ships were smuggling in stuff like rum, tea, sugar, all kinds of stuff from different areas of the world. Um, a lot of that rum and sugar comes from the West Indies, places like Jamaica, um, Haiti, Cuba, those kinds of places. And so those people are taking all those supplies, loading it up on a boat, sailing it up the east coast of the U.S., well, eventually what would be the United States, and then getting to a port like Charleston or New York or Boston and selling that stuff. Technically, it had to go through the British government, and then if you sold it, a portion of your sale would go to taxes, which was going to the British government. Um, but smugglers were doing it because they didn't want to pay those taxes. So the British pass something called the Sugar Act, which basically says the smugglers will be tried by British courts. So those smugglers are going to have to go to England and serve their sentence. Um, this will have a knock-on effect where basically in the next hundred years, British prisons fill up and the British government has to creatively think, how do we solve this issue of having too many prisoners? Uh, their answer is to basically send people to a large island called Australia. And so Australia becomes a giant prison colony um, that eventually becomes its own country. Um, worth pointing out that Georgia also is originally settled as a prison colony. Um, and the reason they picked Georgia and not South Carolina or North Carolina or Pennsylvania is because Georgia, if I go back a couple slides here to our map, okay, this will work. Um, Georgia was buffer territory between British colonies and Spanish colonies. Um, so if the Spanish had attacked a colony, they would be attacking Georgia and the only people they would really be killing would be prisoners. Um, call that what you want, but that's what the British did for, uh, for Georgia. Um, and so the last little bullet here is all these taxes and these crackdowns on taxes lead to angry colonists. Okay. If you were used to buying sugar or rum or tea from a smuggler, or maybe it was smuggled into the country and sold at a store, and then you bought it from that store. If your smuggler gets arrested, then the products go away, but then also you're left having to buy legally imported goods, which is going to be more expensive. So um, there's a lot of knock-on effects here. Uh, it's not just one smuggler getting arrested. It is the supplies stop coming into the country. The prices of those goods increase. There's taxes put onto those higher prices. And now colonists are saying, I can't afford to buy sugar anymore. Um, we'll talk a lot about sugar and why it's important, but essentially people wanted to put sugar in tea because tea without sugar if, you, if you're a fan of sweet tea, you might understand this, but um, it just tastes like leaves and water. And so a lot of people wanted to put sugar in it. Um, okay, I'm gonna run through these questions real quick. Uh, you will probably see these questions again. So uh, I'm gonna go through the answers real quick. And then if you watch all the way to the end, that will benefit uh, you and your grade in this class, okay? So the first question, who fought in the Seven Years War and why? Uh, the who is easy. It's Britain on one team with the colonists. And on the other team, it's the French and the Indians, okay? So those are the two sides. Now, if you wanna complicate things or, or get kind of like a fuller answer, uh, the Iroquois, of course, join in on the British and the American colonists side, and that really helps the British and the American colonists win the war, okay? The why is because American colonists or British colonists living in America were pushing West into French and Native American territory. Um, if they had just stayed put, you know, told where to, where to be and stay there, uh, we wouldn't have had this war and taxes wouldn't have gone up and we might not even be the United States of America as a separate country. So um, lots of uh, hypotheticals here and knock on effects. Okay. Uh, question two, why were the American Indians the biggest losers of the seven years war in North America? Um, firstly, the big reason you could say is probably that Native Americans had a really good relationship with the French. The French came into their land, not trying to shoot them or take their land, but trying to exchange goods for furs. The French furs were, or the Native American furs were super popular in France. And so the French fur traders were trying to get those products back to France. In return, they 
said, well, look, the Native Americans are much better at gathering furs than we are. So let's make this relationship work for both sides. And so the Native Americans were really big fans of the French. Um, once the British took over in this territory, that is when you start seeing a lot of land from Native Americans going away. Um, it is also worth pointing out that something that we're not going to talk about terribly in here is a genocide that happens of the Pequot Native Americans, uh, the British colonists that settle in the Massachusetts Bay Area basically decide that those Native Americans over there are worshiping a different religion, they're dressing differently, and we don't understand their culture, so let's massacre them. Um, and that happens in the 1600s, the Pequot War, I believe. Uh, I don't have my tabs up with my dates or anything, but um, so Native Americans, American Indians were very concerned about British colonists. They were very cool with French colonists. Um, number three, what was the proclamation line and why did colonists dislike it? So the proclamation line per was supposed to prevent colonists from crossing it. Um, colonists really didn't like it because they felt that the British didn't care about them if they crossed that line, which the British government says, yes, exactly. That's the point. Um, so it was, it was kind of, the colonists felt like they were treated like little kids rather than like, you know, fully grown adults who can make their own decisions. Um, question four, how did the seven years war lay the foundation for the American revolution? Um, you know, the American revolution, if you know anything about it, it's not going to be the British versus the French. It's going to be the colonists versus the British government. And so the taxes really from the French and Indian war or the seven years war is a huge effect on the American colonists getting feelings of revolution. Um, and so that's probably the best answer for question four. Number five, is the need for British taxes on the, colon on the colonies justified? I can't really answer you this question. Um, this is more of a judgment call for you. Um, so if you wanted to say, yes, they're justified, you could probably say something like, um, they're justified because the colonists were trying to get, be protected by the British government. And so the British government's basically just saying like, pay us for that protection. Um, if you want to say it's not justified, you could say the colonists really felt like they didn't have a choice in the matter, both in the fact that they were going to war with France and, and the Native Americans, and they didn't have a choice in paying the taxes. Um, in our government today, you know, people vote on politicians and those politicians raise or lower taxes. So there's some amount of democracy that goes into that process. In this time period, that is not a thing. The colonists have no democratic power um, to levy or increase taxes. Um, there are colonial governors and colonial systems of government, but they are not really in charge of the taxes that the British government over in London is going to be collecting. So that is uh, our first unit and our first section, unit one, section one. Um, if you guys have any questions, shoot